afternoon. It's 3.30, so I would like to start now. And uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends of UNU Wider, and the 300 who are following this UNU Wider event by webcast. You may note that there are a couple of missing countries in there, including my own home country that has been rectified during the last couple of days. But this is actually the extent of people who are participating in this event this afternoon. It is indeed an honor for me, on behalf of you and your wider, to welcome you all to this 16th wider annual lecture. The wider annual lecture is delivered each year by a scholar or a policymaker who has made significant contributions to the field of global development and transition. And I'm pleased to say that we are indeed keeping up standards to the highest international level. This year, the lecture will be delivered by Professor Land Pritchett and has been entitled Folk and the Formula, Pathways to Capable States. As some of you may know, uh, we've begun a tradition in you and you wider for selecting colorful titles for our annual lectures. Last year, the title was From Flying Geese to Leading Dragons, and the setting was that of sunny Maputo, Mozambique. This year, we are back at base, in part because we have, over the next couple of, year, uh, ne next couple of days, a major international conference on climate change. Furthering development is a challenge. It's complicated. And development needs a capable state, a state that can carry out the responsibilities that are indispensable for the process of development to take place. Kids must be educated. Effective policies must be pushed in place. Mail must be delivered. Taxes must be collected and spent in an effective way. And when you look out there, there are still major challenges. Countries are struggling and are in many ways and in many places failing to deliver these functions. I believe, and this was behind the choice of the topic for this year, that can there really be any bigger challenge in development economics in furthering the process through building state capability alongside the challenge of helping secure peace in and among states. I think that's an absolutely core topic, and we are most grateful that today's lecturer accepted the challenge to come and present his work and thoughts on this topic. Today's lecturer is an American development economist. He was born in Utah in 1959, and he was raised in Idaho. He graduated from MIT in 1988 with a PhD in economics, and he has, in a number of rounds, worked in key positions in the World Bank. He was a team member on a number of publications. I won't list them here all, but they have played a critical role in influencing discussions over the past 10, 15 years. He uh, has been and is now a professor at the John F. Kennedy School of Government in the practice of economic development. I know from personal conversations with Land Pritchett that he's not quite sure whether he's an aide grunt who writes academic papers or an academic who works in the field. I personally think that that's a brilliant combination, and in any case, Land Pritchett has made a number of absolutely core contributions to the economics of development and to economics in general, ranging topics from education, demography, health, to growth, and the evidence base on which we work. Some of his more recent work includes 
a monograph on Let Their People Come, Breaking the Gridlock on Global Labor Mobility, a point that has caused, and rightly so, a lot of debate. And he was also a co-editor of the World Bank publications on moving out of poverty, success from the bottom up. This contribution created a lot of stir among development practitioners and policymakers. Because rather than giving statistic after statistic on poverty, Axie Land and his colleagues went out and consulted some 60,000 poor people on what they actually think poverty is how it feels to be poor, what poor people actually think they need, and how they actually think that poverty should be defined. And it does reflect Land's long-standing commitment to understand what is really at stake. In between, Land Pritchett has lived and worked in Indonesia during the economic crisis. He's lived and worked in India and by the way, he comes to this lecture today from India, where he is now living. And in addition to that, what is it? Around 40 other countries from which he has experience. Land, it is a great pleasure, it's a great honor for us to warmly welcome you today and to invite you to give the 16th wider annual lecture. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have this tennis ball. You might need to throw this to me later. OK. So you hold that. Um, so sometimes it's really clear what we're talking about. When I very first started thinking about this lecture and what I would say, I was in New Mexico. and stopped to take a picture of this horse. Um, I grew up in Idaho, have an affinity for horses, they're beautiful creatures. Um, and that's a horse, no question about it, it's a horse. And the other picture is a picture of two horses, no question about it, there's two horses. Um, just behind where this horse is, there was another sign that I was in front of the New Mexico Behavioral Health Institute. And I thought, I know what a horse is. What's a behavioral health institute? Well, and I didn't really know what any of those words meant. I didn't know what behavioral health was as opposed to others. And moreover, the sign we care made me very suspicious. Maybe I'm just cynical, but <laughs> if you have to say so. So I then drove further down the street, and it turns out the behavioral health institute has very high fences with rolls of barbed wire across the top. And the Behavioral Health Institute has a double locked door with secure entry, single entry entry, so you can only go in one door at a time. And when I went to take a picture of the Behavioral Health Institute, I was literally threatened with being arrested by a New Mexico policeman. Now wait a second. Oh, I get it. It's that kind of Behavioral Health Institute. It's really a mental lockdown facility for the criminally insane, but that doesn't sound so good, so we'll call it a behavioral health institute. And the people with power get away with calling it that. It is, in fact, a behavioral health institute. So I want to start thinking about a problem, and I want to start with telling you about a joke. I won't even tell you this joke because the joke is so poignant, but I will tell you about a joke. And then I'll follow up with some stories that just motivate kind of the issue I want to talk about that gets under-acknowledged. So I was doing some research on the conditions of Dalits, who were the scheduled caste peoples in India, and their progress under the market reform era, and went out with one of my collaborators, who himself is a Dalit, to visit his villages and the villages where we were doing the research, just so I could, in some sense, feel confident that the results we were seeing I had seen for myself, and we were sitting around with maybe 30 people with one of the most respected members of this Dalit community who had been a school teacher for 25 years, and we're sitting around, 
and he said, let me tell you a joke. I said, okay. You're walking through the jungle, and suddenly you come upon a snake and a teacher. What do you do? It's like, jungle, by yourself, snake and a teacher. Well, obviously, you pick up a stick and beat the teacher. It's like, <laughs> uproarious laughter. Just people rolling on the ground at how funny that was. <laughs> and I kind of looked at, what? And he explained to me, the snake's just a brute. They don't know what they're doing. But the teacher, they know what they're doing and knows better. So partly, one way to frame what I want to talk about is what has the world come to where one of the most dispossessed peoples in the world think a joke about beating a teacher with a stick is hilarious because it represents something very real in their own experience. So now let me tell you another story. Another story a few years earlier, I had gone to visit some research that was trying to improve the quality of schooling by providing parents with information about what their kids could actually do. Very simple things. Can they read a paragraph? Can they do a simple sum? Can they do division? And then publicizing that to the village so that parents would know, here's what your kids can do. And at the end of this research activity, it, as this is an activist working together with a research group trying to see if this worked to create accountability, which we'll get to in a second. And I happened to arrive in one village just as they were presenting the results for the village which not uncommonly in this part of India were just disastrous, disastrous. Uh, I actually went with people to assess whether third graders could read and saw third graders that didn't know which way the text ran. They would take text and sort of turn it various ways trying to figure out what it was. Third grade, 11 years old. Been in school for three years. At this meeting, the headmaster of the school, the government school was there, the village elected head was there. A man stood up about my age and he said, you've betrayed me. You promised me that if I've worked like a donkey my whole life because I didn't get an education, you promised me that if I sent my son to school, he would have a different life than mine. And now I see He's in fourth grade. It's too late. He's not learned anything yet. It's too late for him now. He's going to work like a donkey his whole life, just like me. This, <laughs> I, I, I thought this was emotionally just powerful stuff. I mean, as a development person, you see a lot of things, you hear a lot of things, but to have someone sort of pose so directly the issue that what they thought they were getting out of the government just wasn't happening. And then what was even more striking is after some hubbub and some other people sort of huzzahed in the usual way the British Parliament does, uh, the headmaster stood up and said, you are a donkey. And because you're a donkey, your kids are donkeys. And because your kids are donkeys, we can't teach them. It's not our fault your kid doesn't know anything. It's your fault and your child's fault. In front of a hundred people in the village, this was his account of the school's performance. So what I want to talk today, and I use the word account, because when we get into questions of state capability and state performance and governance, the word accountability is very popular. I've written a whole book, or helped write a whole book, uh, on accountability and getting accountability in government. But I, I'm now thinking, and I'm changing my mind, about the way into accountability. Because there's two ways to think about accountability. One is to think primarily about the accounting. Do we have records, files, numbers about performance? And the second is to think about the account. What's the narrative that people are telling to themselves and to who those they care about about what they're doing that justifies what they're doing. What is the account that this headmaster tells himself on which he isn't, his performance is acceptable 
and he really can cast blame on others. And what I'm convinced is that if we don't fix the thick, deep accounting, the, the deep, thick accounts of how people narrate their performance within organizations and within their context and how that organization is embedded in society, no amount of accountability through accounting can fix the problem. So part of the folk versus the formula is the folk is about accounts, stories, narratives, what we think of ourselves and what others think of us. The formula is about accounting, what numbers we provide, what reports we fill out, how we fill out the numbers that go into spreadsheets that sort of do something, or at least I'm told they do something. I always resist filling them out. So just to, one more illustration of this difference, I'm going to skip some of these stories and tell a story about when I was working in Indonesia. When I was working in Indonesia, uh, we, it was a huge crisis. The price of rice had gone up over 50% in real terms in the course of a month. Country was really on the verge of a breakdown. And we worked together with the government to scale up very rapidly a program to sell subsidized rice to mitigate the consequence of the economic crisis on people through selling them subsidized rice. Terrific idea, terrific design, and the design was that each eligible household would get 10 kilograms of rice at the subsidized price. And the eligible households were determined by a list of who was poor. All very plausible. And I said to the government as we were designing this, and maybe in a slightly more polite way than this, but I'm not a very polite person, as you maybe already guessed. I said, this time you can't really lie to us. Because traditionally, the Indonesian government had just completely lied to the World Bank about what was really going on, and the World Bank, in the interests of maintaining a cooperative relationship, had accepted the lies the Indonesian government told, and all was good. As long as the economy was growing, kind of nobody was too concerned about it. And I said, this time, unfortunately, given the world's pressure, given the crisis situation, given we have to give $2 billion, even though your president has just resigned under fire for being corrupt, you can't lie to us. So let's design a program we can actually implement where you can actually report on what you've done. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to design a program we can't implement and lie to you. I said, OK, but that's going to create problems down the road. So two months down the road, I do what the World Bank, we call a supervision mission. I fly to a place with the reports, amazingly detailed reports of who got the rice. Here's how many households got the rice in this state. Here's how many households got the rice in this district. In this district, here's how many got in this block. In this village, here's who got the rice. And I said to them, these reports, they say who actually got the rice. At the state level, you know what they said? Absolutely. I said, great. Let's go to the village. So we go down to the next level, at the district. It's like. This is, these are the people that got the rice, right? Absolutely. We go down, we finally pitch up <laughs> in this tiny little village, eight land cruisers, you know, because each level we go through, we acquire more and more people, right? I'm sure the village chief is thinking, what in God's name have I done to bring this on me, right? I don't need all these people coming down on my head, but here we were. So he rides up on his little motor scooter after somebody's traced him down, and you know, he's clearly thinking, okay, this just shouldn't have happened to me. So we said, <clears throat> you know, these people, it says, it says these exact people got this amount of rice. Is that really what happened? He said, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and then I said, no, no, but in lots of other villages, the village chief has decided that other people are suffering from the crisis too, and they've decided to share this rice more broadly than just the people on the list. Did you do that? He says, yeah, of course I did that. It's like, you realize that what you just said contradicts. He says, of course I didn't give it to just the eligible households. The other households would have strung me up. It was the first time the ever government's ever done anything actually for us. So it has to be spread equally among all people. I can't possibly just give it to these eligibles on this list. So we just sort of divided it up. And we actually divided it up so where every month the eligible poor people got a third, got half the rice, and so they got more rice than the rest of the village, and then the rest of the village kind of divided up what was left over. And I thought, that's actually pretty good, kind of not a formula I might not have come up with myself had I been confronted with the position the village chief was in. And then I turned to the guys from the state government, 
who of course had been systematically telling me that these reports were saying exactly what was happening on the ground, you know, all the way from the Capitol, you know, each subsequent Land Cruiser ride, they're telling me all the way. And I said, now, why did you tell me that? And they said, we thought you were from the World Bank. That's what you've always wanted to hear before. <laughs> so they were just telling us what we wanted to hear. We wanted reports saying the household's got the rice. They gave us reports saying the household's got the rice. Complete divergence between what was actually happening in practice and what was recorded on paper. Um, complete divergence. Um, and the problem is, by becoming invisible, by the formula not actually being applied, there was a certain amount of reasonable folk behavior in which they accommodated the needs of the whole village to get the rice, and there was a substantial amount of theft. Because once you're not reporting exactly what happens, and there's slippage possible, there's going to be slippage. And some of the slippage is going to be decent and motivated, but some of the slippage is going to be into the, it's going to be off the truck, not everything gets there. And by our estimates, roughly 30% of the rice was disappearing before it ever got to the village. Um, but that was very hard to know because perfectly clean paper trail following every grain of rice right down to the individual household. So this is a roadmap to the presentation which I am now going to go through very quickly. Um, and basically, these, these, the, the points are illustrated. State capability is, <clears throat> actually I'm going to skip this slide. So this is the roadmap to the presentation if this were an academic audience. Here's a pithier <laughs> roadmap in more plain language, which is what I mean by state capability is can you get stuff done, right? Let's think about what it takes to get stuff done and do state. Second, most states in the world actually can't do stuff but say they do. So there's a huge kind of administrative fact that's pure fiction in the, the way that the state is representing itself as having done all kinds of things and doing all kinds of things, it actually has no capability to do. And because it lacks the capability to do it, but it does have the capability to say it did it. This, so, which means this low level of cap capability is in spite of the fact that governments around the world and others have been engaged in this process called development trying to promote capability. So now the question is, is the guest just late or are they just not coming at all? And kind of, if we're 50 years into the development experience and we got the capability we got, it's time to sort of think, maybe they're not coming. Maybe, we've, maybe we're really in some deep and general way just really on the wrong thinking and strategy about how state capability is going to be built. The fourth point is there's a statement that I learned is attributed to the Prime Minister, David Lord George, uh, George is that you can't cross a chasm in two jumps, which makes common sense, in part because if you try and cross a chasm in two jumps and miss on the first jump, well, then your second jump isn't so much of a jump as a hobble because you're at the bottom of the canyon <laughs> and your legs are broken from having missed on the first jump. So we are now not just in the situation in which our theories of state capability haven't been working, but we're in the situation where the theories of capability have failed. So it's not like we have a blank slate on which there is no state capability. We have a situation in which people are pretending to have capability they don't have, which is actually a much more difficult situation to deal with. And then finally, I think, and this is my positive component, I think if I had to phrase in one way what the mistake has been, the mistake has been to think that organizations and institutions build success. So if we're going to have success in doing something, we need to build the organization that does it. Whereas in fact, I think the story is exactly the opposite. Success builds organizations. But organizations can either promote or inhibit success. And our efforts in some times to build successful organizations have prevented us from seeing and doing what is necessary for building success. So we're caught in a vicious circle because we're caught in the wrong side of the causal link. We keep trying to build successful organizations to have success, and in the doing so, 
ignore the fact that we have to have success to build the organization. So that's the roadmap, and here's the roadmap in a metaphor. Um, trees produce fruit. Lots of trees out there aren't producing any fruit. Um, once a tree's dead, getting fruit from it's really hard, but it's still taking up place in the orchard. And trees have to generate root systems to produce fruit. It's the top of the half of the tree where the fruit is. It's the bottom half of the tree from which the tree had to grow. And if you pay all your attention to the top half of the tree, you're not going to get successful trees. So the first point I want to make, and I'm going to make a series of sort of one analytical point and then some empirical points. The analytical point is that what capability consists of at the organizational level is inducing agents who work for the organization to do the right thing. That's pretty that, it's kind of that simple. And the right thing in implementation of policy depends on what the facts are. You have to say, what's the fact of the situation? What does the policy formula tell me I should do in this situation? And therefore, what should I do? If you can do that repeatedly, then your organization has capability to implement the policy. The problem, and this is illustrated with simple examples, let's take the program of subsidized rice. The fact of the world was whether the eligible household was on it. The policy was intended to be to sell that household some rice with an expressed objective of mitigating the consequences of the poor. So there was a s facts about the world, actions to take contingent on those facts that resulted in the policy objective. The problem is, is there's many a slip twixt cup and lip, and that the real action of the publicly authorized agents depend both on the capacity of the agents and the intrinsic and intrinsic motivation of those agents to actually carry out the policy. So now this is kind of a very abstract thing. It goes back to your high school algebra, which I'm sure you all loved, where you had to learn about domains and ranges. But the, the, the benefit of sort of thinking abstractly about policy implementation is it creates the needed distinction between the facts, the policy formula, and the actions. So first of all, we have to be able to map to what the, what the agent should have been doing. Second, organizations that are in which agents are not doing what the real facts they say they should do create a different set of facts that rationalize their actions. So basically, if you're not doing what the facts say you should do, what do you do? You could change your behavior or you could change the facts. And the beauty of being the state is you get to say what the facts are. And finally, the analytical character of the facts turns out to be very important. Um, so let me skip to a, let me just, give an example of what this might mean. So let's say we wanted to know whether our doctors that were working for the public sector were doing a good job. What would we have to know to know whether the doctors were doing a good job? Well, doctors have to map from states of the world, which are patient conditions, to actions they should take, prescribe, diagnose, and prescribe the appropriate treatment. So to know whether a doctor is doing a good job, we kind of have to know whether or what the condition of the patient was. So we actually have to have sophisticated knowledge about the state of the world itself to know whether he's doing the right thing. We can't just say the doctor is doing a good job without, in some sense, having some expertise. Now this illustrates the sort of problem, and I'm using lots of stories from India because I live there, not because India is particularly terrible or unique in its lack of capability. Matter of fact, by most measures of capability we look at, India is in the top half of countries. So when we look at these stories of India, we should think in lots of the rest of the world is much worse than this. But uh, some friends of mine did a study where they examined the actual behavior of a variety of providers of health care in a state of India, Madhya Pradesh, by having actors trained to present as if they were patients. All right? Now, this is what happened in the, this is the ratio of what the public doctors did to what the private doctors were doing. So they only spent 38% as much time, which means the typical visit lasts 2.4 minutes. Now I've been talking about 30 minutes, so 2.4 minutes is very fast. Um, 
They act only 12% even bothered to check the pulse of the person who presented as having asthma, just kind of a necessary and usual diagnostic thing. And only 2.6% of these visits resulted in the doctor giving the right diagnosis. So, the mapping of the agents of the state who had been hired and paid and trained in order to provide healthcare services completely diverged from what you might have hoped, which is they would actually respond to the patient conditions, diagnose correctly, and prescribe the right treatment. And moreover, this is all the ratio of what the private providers in the same place were doing. So the public doctors were only getting to 28% as often the right diagnosis as the uh, private sector doctors. And in a follow on the study, they actually looked at what the public doctors did when they were in their own private practice. And it turns out they behaved exactly like the private doctors in their own private practice. So it was, really was the capability of the state, not the capacity of the doctor, that was producing these results. It wasn't the ability of the doctors, it was their effort. So now, second section of this presentation, which second section of the presentation is when we have this weak implementation, when the state doesn't really have the ability or the agents aren't systematically doing what they, what they are scheduled to do by the policy formula, that is they're not mapping from the state of the world to the action they should, one choice is to change the behavior of the agents. The other choice is to just change the facts. So there was this very good study done where some researchers from MIT and got together with a very competent NGO to try and increase the, mo the motivation and attendance of nurses in the low-level clinics in India. Now, at the time, attendance was running in the baseline, was running at a little bit less than 50%. So this was a massive problem, because who's going to show up to a clinic if the odds are 50-50 that anyone will even be there, right? So you were caught in this vicious circle in which nurses weren't going, patients weren't going, the whole system was breaking down. So they designed this wonderful scheme where they would pay the nurses their full salary if they were there more than half the days, and their pay would get docked if they weren't there more than half the days. And they combined it with NGO involvement and improved technology and time clocks and better specification of their attendance. It was a whiz-bang. None of us in the room could have thought of a better program. What was the impact of this program? Well, given that they were research from MIT, of course, they did a control group and a treatment group, and they followed what happened. Well, what happened was uh, the, the absences went way down. Absence went down from 25% to under 10%. So you might think, wow, terrific program, we reduced absence. The only problem is physical presence went way down too. <laughs> so actually, way fewer of the nurses were actually there. In the treatment group exposed to this fancy program, by the end of 16 months of being part of this program, only a third of the nurses were there versus 45 percent at the baseline. So now you might think, well, wait a second, they're either present or they're absent, right? Ah, <laughs> you have not worked long enough in a bureaucracy. You can be exempt from being there. And obviously, if you're exempted from being there, then you're neither there nor not there. You're exempted from being there. So what really happened was as you put high-powered pressure on the nurses to show up, that created high-powered incentives for them to have a paper saying, I don't need to be there, so even though I'm not there, it doesn't count as an absence. So exemptions went from 13% to over 40% of all days. So what really happened was you just had a standing exemption form signed by a higher-up and if it looked like you were otherwise going to be monitored, you just filed your exemption from duty. So, did we solve the problem or make the problem worse? We just made the problem much worse because now the government claims they've solved the absence problem. And they have the documentation to prove it. We have absence rates at the world best practice. 
Only 10% of our nurses are absent on any given day. And here's the records. Here's the paper trail. So administrative fact becomes complete fiction. And I can show you example after example of that, but I'm going to skip through this even though this is my own research and I would love to show it to you. Is that clock really right? Maybe I'm going faster than I thought. Oh, well, I'm going to go back. <laughs> yeah. So, so what, this, what this does is it creates a world in which what's on the books, what's on the law, what's said to be the de jure practice has nothing to do with the life as the citizens of the place are actually encountering it. Nothing to do with it. So the World Bank did a study of how long it would take a, a business to get a construction permit if it followed the law. So they hired some lawyers and they hired some technical people and they went out and they looked through and they talked to people who did this and they said, in this country it would take you 282 days to get a construction permit and in this day it would take you 152 days to get a construction permit. Now, the beauty of the bank, the World Bank, is it's this large chaotic organization in which people do directly contradictory things. So fortunately a different group in the World Bank went out and actually asked firms how long it took them to get a construction permit. And they asked lots of firms so you had a distribution. So some firms said it took them a little time and some firms said it took them a long time. So we can compare the fast firms and the slow firms. And what does it look like? Well what it looks like is the law basically has no impact on the fast firms. Some firms say it takes them 10 days to get a construction permit, and they say it takes them 10 days in countries where it's 90 days on the law, 120 days on the law, 220 days on the law, 320 days on the law. It doesn't matter what the law says. The firms that get permits fast get permits fast. Right? Now, I'll leave it to your imagination why this might be so, because we don't actually have a lot of direct evidence. But my analogy is, if the wind's blowing too hard on the surface, you become a submarine. Right? Once you're a submarine and somebody says, how hard is the wind blowing? I don't really care. I'm a submarine. I have adapted my business to the needs. So I call this for my friends anything. But for my enemies, the law. There are some firms that took a year to get a construction permit in exactly the same countries where other firms got it in 10 days. So the law did create a mechanism in which firms could be substantially delayed in their getting of a construction permit. Now, in all of these cases, I am sure that no one ever says the law has been violated or not followed. You've just exempted, or this doesn't apply, or we've found some way in which your particular business can get a construction permit on an expedited basis. But what that means is the reality of what the law says is the regime for getting the construction permit in this country has nothing to do with what real businessmen are actually doing and nothing to do with what the real implementers of these policies are actually doing. It's a very much more... So, third section which is, if state capability were coming to the party, it would be here by now. It's not stuck in traffic. <laughs> this isn't like a minor delay, oops, we thought it'd be here, but it's 15 minutes late because traffic was bad. There's something deeply wrong with our theory and our fundamental notions of what we, how we thought we were going to get to capable states. So, in the sort of opening eras of, of development thinking, People thought hard and they thought about state capability. They realized you needed post offices that worked. They realized you needed schools that worked. They ne realized you needed tax collectors. But the assumption was this was the easy part of development. What can be easier than making a post office run, right? What could be easier than taking the established models that we have in the rest of the world and making those work in these countries that already have the incipient forms of tax collection agencies? So I'm going to skip that because it's terrible. So there was this idea of accelerated modernization. It's got to be easier to catch up than it was to lead. It's got to be easier to adapt a wheel than invent a wheel, right? The powerful intuition was that this process of building capable states was going to be easy because people ahead of us had already done. Well, where did we actually end up? What do the data say about what 
the capability of states is, if we use the horse as a metaphor, what does your horse look like that's your government? This is a Belgian horse. Big, strong, capable, willing. Belgian has a high level of state capability. They can pull lots of stuff. And then the world consists of everything in between. We got some really strong and capable states. We got some really cute but kind of tiny and not very capable states. And then we got uh, things that aren't really horses at all but kind of pretend they're horses. Um, so if you look at just a basic function of government, a recent study just said how well do states deliver the mail, right? And all they did was they mailed 10 letters to fake addresses from an international address. The International Customs Postal Union says those should be returned to the country of origin if you can't find the address within 30 days. And they just said how many of these letters came back within 90 days. Let's give them three times what the code we've all agreed to as the standard for which we'll return letters. Well, in the lowest 25%, none of the letters came back. It was as if the letters just fell into a black hole. And we might say, well, of course, Somalia, if you mail a letter to Somalia, you don't expect it to come back. But this included countries like Ghana, Egypt, Honduras, you know, none of the letters came back. The Lowest quintile, lowest quartile of income countries, only 9% of the letters came back. In Finland, 90% of the letters were back within 90 days. Finland is a high cap capability country. Um, uh, and other countries like Colombia and Uruguay had similar high levels of performance. So this is just one, you know, just, just one measure, but it's a nice concrete measure because <clears throat> A post office has never been a huge ideological dispute. Everybody agreed that countries should have a post office. Everybody's agreed we should build the capability of the post office. But we're 50 years into it and we have a huge number of post offices that are essentially dysfunctional. It's not like this is like we've only been at it five years, we've only at it 10 years. It's not like we just decided to do this seven years ago and this is our new initiative. This is a basic core function of government that functional governments have been doing successfully for 200 years. And we have half of the countries in the world at just incredibly low levels of capability. And if we look at the trajectories that our countries are on, how fast do their capabilities appear to be growing, they're growing at levels that are not just not accelerated modernization, they're decelerated modernization. We calculated in a paper how long it would take Haiti at its apparent rate of progress to get to the same level of capability as Singapore. And our calculation turned out that they will reach Singapore's level of capability in the year 4,168. <laughs> Which is, of course, facetious. I don't mean that as a precise. Maybe it'll be 4,150, maybe 4,175. But Haiti's been an independent country since 1806. And it's gotten to where it's gotten through whatever process and dynamic that's underway, only as far as it's gotten. So if it has the dysfunction it has after 200 years of trying, another 200 years of trying the same may well produce the same results. So if we look at another measure that actually has reasonable sort of time series information on progress, what we find is that the success countries are few and far between. If we look at the countries that in 2008 are either above the level of Portugal in terms of their current capability, and I chose Portugal because it's the kind of least capable state that you play soccer with. <laughs> so Portugal's kind of in the club of people you play soccer against and call it the European Cup, right? But it's, so it's kind of a developed country, but it's kind of a developed country you go on a vacation, right? It's not like super in the club. Um, so that's the level at which government capability, how many developing countries have made it to above that level, which isn't like you would have thought if our theories of promoting state capability were working and we really had accelerated modernization, that would be most of them. Instead, there's only eight countries that have made it above that level and only four that are making progress at a rate that would take them across the spectrum of capability in less than 200 years. So we have exactly 12 successes. 
eight that are at a high level, four that are growing rapidly, and by rapidly it's just a growth in capability on a zero to 10 scale greater than 0.05, which means to take you from zero to 10, which is Somalia to Singapore would take you 200 years, which is hardly accelerated modernization. Then the rest <clears throat> are either these F states, failed, flailing, fractured, fragile. We, hate, we keep having to change F words as each new one becomes sort of overused. Um, where they're just at very low levels of capability and so the process of acquiring capability has failed. And then most of the, it's what I call the muddle in the middle, 42 countries in the last 10 years have actually had, according to this measure, negative progress in getting state capability. Well, if you've got negative progress in state capability and your child says, how long till we get there, dad? Well, the answer is forever because we're in reverse. We're going the wrong damn way. We're not going to get there anytime soon if we keep going that direction. So the problem is that <clears throat> what we thought was obvious, what we thought was easy, what we thought we could ignore turns out to be really hard. And the building of capability of states has by and large not been successful, had much less success, and countries are today going backwards or still making very slow progress for the most part. So, what's my hypothesis? <clears throat> my hypothesis is that in order to have successful organizations that exhibit high capability in carrying out functions, you need two things. One, you need successful internal folk culture of performance. What do I mean by that? I mean that people have to do their job because they want to do their job and it's part of their identity that their job gets done. So we have members of the Finnish government here, right? I won't. There are lots of reasons why they might or might not do the job, but I think probably the main reason they do the job is that's what they do. That sounds circular, but it isn't. They're embedded in a folk culture in which it would be unthinkable for them to not behave in the ways that they're supposed to behave. And the folk culture is a culture of performance inside. Doctors doctor because they're doctors. Teachers teach because they're teachers. What does that mean? There's an internal folk culture of what it means to be a teacher that you conform your behavior to. That's a strong part of what drives performance, but those organizations are also embedded in an external folk culture of accountability. And by folk culture, again, I mean that it's not what's, the rules aren't what matters. <laughs> it's the process and the way in which the rules are arrived at that matters, and that happens behind the scenes. So it isn't getting, so, <laughs> so it isn't getting to the right rules. It's how you got to the right rules. And the only way to get to the rules that are right is to actually have the struggle of producing those rules through struggle. Okay? And I'm, I'm trying to, because I, 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 I want to, and there's, two very different reasons why you might not be able to transplant institutions and I want to be very clear what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying is one size doesn't fit all. That's not what I'm saying. This has become a cliche in development to say one size doesn't fit all. Well, that's really not that true, right? I mean, look at this shoe of mine, right? Now, this shoe would not fit every person in this room. But it had come pretty close, right? Because first of all, a lot of you are probably si well, I don't know what a European size is this, 40? What is it, does anybody know? American nine, okay? Okay? So it's not, and second, the shoe that fits you isn't gonna be twice this big. Nobody in the room wears a shoe twice this big, and it's not gonna be half as big. It's gonna be about this size. So the problem isn't actually coming to a knowledge, you know, I, I grew up until I, you know, I had two older brothers, so until I was 16, I never had to take the tag off any piece of clothing. I wore hand-me-downs my whole life, right? <laughs> I mean, I knew that lots of sizes could fit me because they said, it's time to go to third grade, here's your brother's third grade clothes, right? 
I was complaining about this to somebody who then pointed out that at least I had older brothers. He had older sisters, so. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so part of the theory and the paradigm that led to the strategy that led to the tactics we have been pursuing and promoting state capability is the theory that it was institutions and organizations that would produce success. So our strategy was to build organizations and institutions and the tactics therefore were derived of let's train individuals, let's pass laws, let's create budgets, let's create the mechanisms of thin accountability, the kinds of things you can count through accounting, whereas our theory is that institutions and organizations are the result of successes and successful formal organizations are usually the consolidation of already successful folk practices. So the institution doesn't create the success, it formalizes the success. Which means, what's our strategy if that's the right theory? Our strategy has to be to create success. So, I'm now going to skip this whole bunch of interesting slides um, that they'll all be posted uh, on those of you watching on the web and here the slides will be posted so if you feel like seeing those slides and believe me if you see them and understand them it'll change your life completely um, but I'm skipping them <laughs> because I'm trying to finish at 430 so we can have a half an hour of questions and if the first question is what was on those slides wouldn't that be fun <laughs> anyway, I'm going to skip now to, uh, no, I'm going to skip this whole section too, in spite of pictures of snakes and stuff. So I'm going to skip to kind of what, that, this is just why the problem is even harder. This is sort of going through why having a failed post office is in some sense even harder problem than not having had a post office at all in terms of building a new post office, because the existing post office is taking up the space for a post office, right? even if it's not a post office, or acting as a post office. So, um, okay, and now I've skipped lots of slides. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to juggle. <clears throat> and I have, because I think juggling, partly I've always wanted to juggle, um, and I've always wanted to juggle in the pretext of an economics talk. Um, and I thought that if I could have just learned to ride the unicycle, I could have had a different career. But if you watch somebody juggle, think about how juggling happens, right? One thing is you have to build up the components such that you become successful at one skill at a time until that skill becomes a routinized pattern and you can move on to the next skill. So one skill you have to have to juggle is to successfully toss the ball from one hand to another. That skill has to be learned, produced, and routinized before it can be combined with the skill of tossing another ball while that ball's in the air, right? So you have to routinize the catch and toss such that I can now talk to you while catching and tossing because I gave him a ball in case I dropped one and needed one, but it looks like I don't even need one. So part of the process of, now, if we said to Finn, can you juggle? <laughs> come on up here. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. You, come, you had a ball, come up here. Can you juggle? No. Nope. So the question is, if I were going to transfer to him the skill of, of juggling, how would we do it? Well, the problem is if I just give him the balls and ask him to juggle, in spite of the fact he's now seen me juggle, this should be easy, right? Sure. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Look at <laughs> There you go, one at a time. <laughs> okay. But the point is you can't skip the struggle to juggle. Wow, I didn't realize that rhymed until just now. <laughs> Meaning, even if everybody who juggles is going to end up juggling in roughly exactly the same way, that doesn't mean I can transplant juggling skills. 
The juggling skills have to be built up by the person who then has them, and unless you have personally built up the capability of juggling, you can't juggle. So how would organizations, who are now, by the way, well into the process of dysfunction, how, how would we think about turning around the process of dysfunction to get them on a different dynamic so that they were building their capability? And we think there's four steps to this. The first <clears throat> is that you've got to start with locally nominated problems for which people want solutions. Now, I know that that sounds trivial, right? It's like, of course. Why, you know, how would you start otherwise than locally nominated problems? Most of development practice starts exactly the opposite. You start with solutions that you want people to implement. You don't come and ask, what's your problem? You come and say, here's the solution, without asking <laughs> what exactly the problem in the context was that they felt like solving. So A, it has to be a problem, not a solution, and B, it has to be locally nominated. Now, I don't want to get into criticizing the MDGs, but the MDGs were not locally nominated problems. Those were internationally agreed upon goals, targets, but they didn't necessarily pa pass into what the people in the country at the time really wanted to solve. So within your organization, you've got to have local people, you've got to set the agenda such that people are going to be able to create an internal folk culture of caring about getting the problem solved, which can't get there if you start with solutions, can't get there if you start with external problems. Um, second, you've got to have what we call positive deviation. And this, what I'm going to say next, is going to sound crazy. <clears throat> and what I want to emphasize is don't think, is it crazy? Think, is it crazy enough? Because after all, we're talking about places like Pakistan, like Haiti, like Afghanistan, like Nepal, where there's been 50 years of trying to fix capability. So if I, what I tell you sounds like the conventional wisdom, you should be very suspicious because the conventional wisdom's had a lot of time to work. So what's crazy is I'm going to say that we need, in environments in which organizations aren't functioning, we need to allow people more space to deviate not less space. Crazy? So what I, so what I want to say is, <clears throat> this is a very busy slide, lots of organizations, particular ones that are dysfunctional, have three kinds of kind of intrinsic people in them. They have rent seekers, people who given their own druthers would take advantage of the system. They have bureaucrats that are willing to be policy and compliant and doing what they're told. And then we have innovators. And the danger is that we set up process control barriers to prevent the rent seekers from doing what the rent seekers would do. The problem is those process controls are symmetric. They also prevent innovators from undertaking innovations that might lead to solutions that aren't in the established repertoire of the organization. That isn't what we do here. You can't do that. You can't spend that. You can't choose that. So you actually create a space for achievable practice that has narrowed the range and frustrated precisely the people you want driving your internal folk culture. Who do you want driving your folk culture? Who do you want re respected within your folk culture? You want these people. So what you want to think of instead is how do we create a system of feedback of outcomes on a positively defined problem such that we can create space into which the policy deviators can move in the interest of finding solutions to that problem. We're going to allow you to do things we wouldn't have otherwise allowed you to do because we have a well-specified problem and if you can solve that problem, we'll let you do it. Again. Every bureaucrat in the room knows just how hard this is and just how crazy this is. But what this actually said, what we're saying is, is that rather than focusing on process control, fixing the problem,
by strengthening the process controls, when you know that the rent seekers can defeat the process controls that you have, and so the only people that will be affected by the process controls you implement will be precisely the people you didn't want to piss off. Since the rent seekers can control the declaration of the state of the world and hence the administrative fact, you can't struggle on administrative facts with the rent seekers and win. They've won already. Does everybody get this, right? If, if, they, can, if they can say what the state of the world is, which they can because they have the juridical authority to do it, you can't win by fighting on thin accountability with them. They've already won the battle against thin accountability. What you have to create is the thick accountability of an account of what the organization does that can motivate people to act. Well, who's going to be motivated first? These people. Then, if you have feedback that this is working, ha! Your PowerPoint slide can move. <laughs> That's a minor achievement, I know, but for a guy my age, I was very impressed. <laughs> so, second thing. You got to create space for positive deviation around a problem that's defined. Third thing, you got to have real time feedback loops that feed into decisions of the organization about your problem. And I won't go into this because we can come back to it, but what I don't mean is monitoring and what I don't mean is impact evaluation. Impact evaluation is roughly worthless in this situation. Because impact evaluation is what the right policy formula is. But nobody is implementing the policy formulas we have. We can't solve the problem with better policy formulas if that's not the problem. And nobody inside the organization is actually interested in improving performance anyway. So second thing is try, learn, iterate, adapt. Because only learning is learning. If the agents of the organization didn't learn it, they didn't learn it. You are not going to beat doctors into being better doctors. You are not going to beat teachers into being better teachers. You're not going to beat policemen into being better policemen. And you're not going to go to policemen with the results of a study that shows that things would be better if they behaved in this way or that way and expect them to change their behavior unless they themselves felt part of the learning such that they felt that they knew what you now know in a way that they can act on it. Wow, these are long sentences. Fortunately, there are very long papers to go with these long sentences, so I'll go ahead. And the fourth thing is, what's the fourth thing? Oh, it's how learning is diffused. So, problem-driven, locally nominated problems, positive deviation, feedback loops, learning diffused, laterally, horizontally, as part of a folk culture of learning and performance in an organization, not as part of a top-down culture of policy implementation, because in the kinds of problems we have, which is what the slides I skipped called implementation intensive service delivery, teachers, doctors, every kind of sophisticated thing governments do actually requires the agents to behave in ways that are very difficult to motivate unless they believe that what they're doing is effective. So, those are the four things. Um, again, this might seem like common sense, but it's the exact opposite of how nearly every development project is structured. Nearly every development project is the action is driven by solutions. The planning is lots of advanced planning on which implementation is expected to follow without any hiccups. The feedback loops are mainly around process controls and only over the very long term and they're not linked to decision loops and the plans for scaling and diffusion of learning are top down. We'll learn, they'll implement. Design is for geniuses, implementation is for dummies. So, I'm going to skip that. So, <clears throat> I'm really in an ideal situation for me because I have a solution you don't want for a problem you won't admit you have. <laughs> so governments around the world won't even admit to having this problem because they've created a set of administrative facts that are fiction in order to defend themselves from precisely on having to act on the problems we're talking about. So, and to some extent, governments who work with governments are in a very difficult position of not accepting as fact the administrative fiction other governments tell them. So it's a problem no one wants to admit to having. 
You don't want to admit that your government isn't, in fact, doing what it's saying. It's a very difficult conversation for a government to have, to say, all those records we had about nurses being there, they weren't really there. All those people we said were getting the rice, they weren't really getting the rice. All those roads we were saying we were building, a third of the money was going missing. All those policemen who were on the books, they're really organized crime. That's a very difficult conversation to have. Then the solutions people do want are, are the solutions that fit the existing paradigm. More inputs, if we just gave another X million dollars, more training, if these doctors just knew more, they'd do better. Uh, build up these organizations, let's adapt best practice, we haven't just been doing the latest thing, if we just did this thing versus that thing. All of these are easy and convenient, and they're the solutions that the world wants, but they're just not going to work, because if they were going to work, they would have worked by now. And they say, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop in two minutes, <clears throat> there are these two sayings that are folk sayings. One is, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's a very motivating statement, right? If you first you don't succeed, try, try again. The second statement is, the definition of crazy is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. <laughs> so when you try, try again, it means try something different. It doesn't mean try the same thing again and again. That's crazy. And yet we're trapped in a structural crazy. So at the World Bank, I remember going to a meeting that was reviewing a World Bank project to give hundreds of millions of dollars to the education ministry in Kenya. A huge component of the project was called institutional strengthening. All these wonderful plans for strengthening the capability of the Ministry of Education in Kenya. And I was the peer reviewer invited inside the organization to co comments. And guess what the name of the project was? Kenyan Primary Education 6. So from the title, I presumed, there had been five before. And yet the project document for Kenya Primary Education 6 started by telling how the Kenyan Ministry of Education had no capability. So the obvious question was, if one didn't work, and two didn't work, and three didn't work, and four didn't work, and five didn't work. When do we get to crazy? When do we admit that we're really on a fundamentally wrong strategy and have to try a solution we don't want, which is to actually unleash the power that exists in the folk cultures, inside the organizations, in the countries around the world, so that they can find their way to their own solutions? Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.